Hello everybody. So, uh, in a departure slightly from the title of my talk, um, this talk isn't actually entirely about XIM, um, Perl or SNMP. It's a bit of that and it's a bit of OpenNMS and mainly it's net SNMP. So, the actual real title of this talk could be uh, Working with NetSNMP Extend. So, we're going to talk through using NetSNMP Extend to actually uh, monitor arbitrary bits of information from XIM and Spam Assassin. And then we're going to talk about a few bits and pieces regarding mail queues and mail statistics within XIM. So, my name's Ian Norton, and I work for Shadowcat Systems, which is a small consultancy based in the northwest of England. And we do software consultancy, systems automation, and jinking noises from the back. <laughs> So, NetSNMP Extend, monitoring arbitrary things. Um, we'll be using XIM as an example just because it's convenient and it's what I'm familiar with. Uh, and we'll be doing funky stuff with OpenNMS. So, has anybody actually worked with email systems? I'm sorry. <laughs> They're all evil. Terrible, terrible things. A purge on humanity and things. XIM, in my opinion, is less evil. Um, it's an open source mail transport agent that also acts as a mail delivery agent, extensively written by the University of Cambridge um, and a guy called Phil Hazel, who's actually a very nice chap, plays viola. <laughs> so, in a previous life, I was um, postmaster at Lancaster University in the northwest of England, and um, we had quite a big infrastructure, um, probably not what some of you have would call large, but it's the biggest I've worked on. So uh, we had about 20,000 mailboxes um, across multiple diverse systems. So a bit of Exchange, a bit of Unix, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of Lotus Notes, which we don't really talk about. Um, and uh, it looked something like this. So we had a big fat pipe out to the internet with a stack of mail hubs, five of them, and then um, our exchange system, our Unix mail system, which was mainly for the students, and then we had a few departments pottering around doing their own thing, mainly the computing department, but a couple of the others did their own thing as well, just be because they were sadists or something. So, um, it was fun and interesting in many ways. Um, I'm going to talk through a couple of failure modes that we saw uh, and why they're actually interesting in terms of OpenNMS. So, let's look at our first failure. So, all of our hubs were, had uh, standard monitoring, what you've called standard. So, port 25, TCP, is it there? Excellent. Check the banner. How long did it take to respond? So, five systems. They're all fine. The only problem is that we're getting complaints. We're receiving reports that uh, messages aren't arriving. Um, people are sending messages, just not arriving. And then, after a while, the senders are receiving the obligatory 400 series messages for temporary failure. So, uh, this is getting a bit concerning. So, some senders are saying, temporary failure, oh no, and just dropping the message on the floor, because they're not compliant to the standard. So, they just don't try again. So, we're losing mail. This is very bad. Somewhere external, we might be getting bounces generated as a result of this, but maybe not. So, the sender may be getting notification. They may not be getting notification. The messages might be arriving. Monitoring says it's all fine, so clearly there's no problem. Only problem is that actually, yeah. So... We didn't understand the actual failure mode before it started to cause us an issue. And you can't monitor it if you don't actually understand it, because how are you testing for that if you don't know what to test for? So, one of our mail systems had an issue. Spam Assassin has carked it. Dead, fallen on the floor, no process. So... Monitoring says there's no problem because port 25 is still responding, XIM's still there, still taking TCP connects, 
Absolutely fine. Exim can't talk to Spam Assassin, so it does the safe thing. It says the monitoring's wrong. So um, it can't talk to Spam Assassin, so it temporarily fails because it's the safe thing to do. So all the four machines are working. The issue is that some of these clients that are sending to us, the external MTAs that are sending to us, have um, cached the DNS entry. So once there are four other machines that are working fine, <laughs> external machines have gone, ah, Lancaster AC UK, this, that's, that's mail system there. So they're always trying the same host. <laughs> so whilst it all appears fine, some hosts are seeing a repeated problem because they're always trying the same host. So service is affected, messages are delayed. We generally classify this as fail. So at some point, someone needs to call me to fix it. And I failed to detect the problem. So we can't really fix it quickly. So there we go. Spam assassin process went away. Exim is unable to scan the messages. Temporary reject because it's the safe behavior. It can't, it can't process the message. So it just says, no, go away. So how do we test it? How can we add this to our monitoring to actually get OpenNMS to tell us when this happens so we can preempt the problem and actually have the service back up before the users report it? Because temporary failure shouldn't be a problem, really. Before we monitor it, we need to test it. So Spam Assassin provides an incredibly handy tool called SpamC. Uh, and you can feed it a batch SMTP um, session and it will say yes this is spam or no this is spam not spam oh. so you give it a file it treats it as a batch SMTP operation and it gives you a one or a zero if it's spam it comes back one if it's not spam it comes back zero so exit codes on the uh, on the CLI dead easy to test for so this is where Perl comes in I'm a Perl programmer. <laughs> I confess, I'm not going to apologize. I like Perl. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a list of files. And then we're going to say what exit code we expect to get back from SpamC in order to see if the test is going to give us the result we expect. Does that make sense? So pass this file to SpamC. I'm expecting a zero back. What did I get back? Zero. It's all good. So very straightforward. This is what it looks like. <laughs> I'm not going to dwell on this too long. But um, with two files right at the top here, one of which is a normal message, and one of which is the best spam message I could construct at the time, which had all sorts of nasty words in it. <laughs> um, Ah, I didn't know that. You see, you can do that with the iCar with antivirus, but I wasn't actually sure. That's actually the same ah, <coughs> learn something new every day. Thank you. Um, so you chuck two, two files at it, and the expected return values are 0 or 1. Dead straightforward. So we're looping through those, testing each file. So if we want to chuck more files in there, we can randomly add you know, um, things like, I, I actually tested for etc. password. Um, on the basis that etc. password should get an access denied passing to this. So is the behavior you're chucking at etc. password failing in the right way? Are you getting the permission denied that you would expect? So then we write the status to a file. Dead straightforward. Stick it in a file. Bish bosh. Single value. What could be easier? So now we know when we've got fail. Now what? Chuck SNMP at it. It's clearly the solution to all of our problems. So SNMP, uh, Net SNMP has a wonderful feature <coughs> called extend. And with extend, you can call an external command. So you chuck it an external command, and it will execute that command and return the results of the command out to your SNMP call. It's actually really, really handy. And it looks like this. So 
from here, we can see that um, you can actually see the command that's calling. We can see the arguments that were called. And um, most interestingly is this line here, the bottom line. I normally have a clicky thing for this, but I left it in uh, England. So the bottom line there gives us the output line. And this is interesting because we've only got one value in that file at the moment. It's a one or a zero. So we can pull that data in and we can predict that um, if we call that OID, it's going to give us a one or a zero consistently based on the contents of that file. Fail badly. <laughs> Um, there are various problems with this technique, quite a few, which I'll come on to in a bit. So, uh, so now we've got this very, very, very basic monitoring sorted. We can add that to OpenNMS. And we can call the polar, give it the OID, and um, away we go. We're checking to see if it's zero. If it's zero, then fail is zero. If it's one, then we've failed, and that's bad. So, looking at this OID that I showed you just a moment ago, we've got the command output, the actual number of the command that's being executed. So if you've got multiple extend statements within your SNMP config, that's the number of the command instance, followed by an ASCII representation of the value you put in the SNMP config. So that's SA hyphen status as an ASCII string of numbers. And then finally, we've got the line number of our command output. So looking at all that together, it breaks down quite well. So chucking that in OpenNMS, we add our foreign source um, using the SNMP detector. We chuck the necessary OID in, and then we add the SA status service to our node. And it works. Hooray! <laughs> but it sucks. It's really, really, really bad solution. It's all right for very, very small problems. The issue is. What happens if the file's stale? What happens if the process that was running that check died two days ago? What happens if the file doesn't exist? Single value instance mapping, it's really, really not very net SNMP table mapping do free. It works for really, really simple problems. You can have multiple lines, but it assumes the ordering of the lines that it's going to return. So what happens if we want to add a service, or we want to remove a service, or we want to reorder the file because I'm having a momentary OCD attack and I want it all alphabetical now? <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> Somebody at some point will edit it and go, ooh, these should be. Um, so yes, there, there are many, many problems with this solution. So if we talk instead about mail queue size, we actually care about which domain has the most messages queued, which are local to our systems, which are remote. We had one department that insisted on firewalling their machine. And when we renumbered the mail hubs, we told them, we're not going to warn you that this is going to happen. We're just going to do it. So. We'd renumber our, our machines, or put a new machine up, or whatever, and port 25 access to their mail server would be denied. So their mail would queue on one machine consistently and just sit there, not moving. So we had to know about this in order to ring them and say, look, you've done it again. <laughs> or they'd turn their mail server off for Christmas. That was another trick they did. Uh, <laughs> Yes, really, I'm not joking. So, our single file approach does not scale. Uh, it is the suck. 
So clearly, much in the same way as adding SNMP will solve our problems, we can add cloud, no, more files. Clearly, cloud is not a solution to this problem. So let's output two files. And in our two files, we can create a file with keys and a file with values. And if we're writing them both at the same time, we know the ordering. And the ordering doesn't matter because the keys and the values will always have the same line numbers. Fairly straightforward. Data can change. Open NMS can map the two together for us using instances. And we can even add a timestamp to make sure that the file's not stale. Although I haven't quite worked out how to test that yet. <laughs> so we output to two files. We, uh, we take a small chunk of Perl here. And we've got our statistics in a, in a, a hash reference. And as you can see, we're opening um, two files up here, one for the keys, one for the statistics. We're writing the uh, time, current timestamp. And then we're going to iterate through all the keys and write them to the keys in the statistics file at the same time so that we guarantee the order of them. So line 5 will always be line 5 in both files. Unless something hideous happens. But we won't go there. So, that's great. We can create our keys and values files, but how do we generate the, the data we're interested in? And uh, that's actually remarkably easy with Exim. I don't know about other MTAs, but Exim has a tool called Exipic. And Exipic has a flat queue option, which delivers you a file that is perfect for parsing. It's brilliant. Uh, so it turns a massive headache into a very, very simple problem and you can chuck extra options at it and get additional data or remove data or and it's it's all very nice and very shiny so what we can then do is we've got our exipic here and we've got the options to exipic so our options to exipic are including the variables message size and deliver freeze actually we're not using this in this example but the code that I took this from summed the total queue size as well and total number of messages and various other bits. I took that out to simplify it. So that's an exercise for the reader if you want to. So we're going to create a list of uh, domains here that we're interested in. We're going to initialize all of those to zero. And then we're going to run our exipic command. And our exipic command is going to return some output. Loop through our output and process it line by line to give us some sensible chunks of data. What we're actually interested in from that output is the domain of the recipient. Nothing else. We don't actually care about anything else for this example. So again, this takes the line and eventually just comes out with a message recipient. That's what all of that does. Then we fire off to yet another function <laughs> that then counts that information. But it also records whether the domain that that email address is being sent to is what we would consider it to be internal or not. So if it's in example.com, then we add it to our internal counter. Um, we also check to see if there's a specific domain defined in our data structure and we add one to that if it is. Um, and same for this, if it's example.com then we add that to star.example.com if it's not something more specific that we know about. And then if we don't match any of those then clearly it's an external address that we don't know about. So have I lost anybody? Good, good, that's good. So, the data that that generates looks like this. Very, very simple, very straightforward. So we've got department one, exchange, external, internal, and star. And these write our two files. 
Once again, we have a little chat with NetSNMP. And this time we've got two definitions. One for the keys file, one for the stats file. Exactly the same as previous. And if we walk those values, we can now see lines one through six, and lines one through six. So we can see star.example.com has 50. Very, very simple, straightforward way of doing that. Means that you can chuck arbitrary data at that and it will generate that for you fine. So now we can monitor that with OpenNMS. Once again, we define our uh, resource type. Now, this is slightly different than the other one because we're actually collecting data on this because we're interested in those values. We're not just checking them for one or zero. We're actually interested in the values contained. So, block at the top here sets our persistent selector strategy. Specifically, we're not interested in storing the timestamp. So, if MLQ key is just numbers, then we're not interested in it because that's the timestamp. Otherwise, we actually store that and we're storing it by MLQ instance. Nope, oh, storage strategies here, sorry. Um, so we're storing that by sibling column name, MLQ key. So on the file system, that looks as a directory called XIM MLQ key with all of our instances within that. So that's fairly straightforward, nothing radical there. So this is exactly the same technique you would use for network interfaces, only slightly different. Having done that, we can create our instances now for statistics and keys. So now we've got statistics, keys, and MLQ instance. Drop that into a system definition that includes that. And this sysoid mask here is basically including anything with NetS and MP. It's probably not the best thing to do in production. Your mileage may vary, so might need to experiment with that a little bit. My particular situation, we've got a very, very small installation, so it's not really an issue. From that, we can generate graphs. And our graphs, again, are nothing really that interesting. It's fairly basic open NMS stuff. Graphs, yay! <laughs> so, now we get thresholding for free. We get um, all the other toys that come with open NMS. All from a very, very basic principle of we stick it in a file and then we retrieve it from the file. Further things we, uh, we might actually want to consider or could chuck in there at some point in the future as a general XIM idea is um, <coughs> antivirus. So we were using Sophos antivirus at Lancaster along with uh, Sophie, which is a free daemon to manage Sophos antivirus through XIM, which works really well, um, but it's paid for. Um, and we were chucking EICAR, which is a test virus, at that to say, is this a virus? Along with a normal file and an access denied file and various other test files, just to say, is this actually the results we're expecting? Identical technique to, to what I've shown you with the spam assassin stuff. Total number of messages. We're, we're iterating through the exipic output. We can just count how many messages are there. It's very easy. We can stick that in another file that we can then retrieve. Log file parsing. Um, I used to do um, a separate set of scripts that parsed the output from the XIM reject log and the XIM main log that extracted the spam assassin statistics and then fed that into our RD tool. There's no reason that these days that we couldn't do that through OpenNMS using the syslogd. Haven't got there? I think it might be cool. Message transit times. I was looking forward to Jeff's talk on this because he was saying about monitoring enterprise mail systems, but 
Um, sadly, he was unwell, so I missed that. And RBL monitoring, another one. We, we had a script with a list of RBLs that just went out, checked all of the RBLs we knew about against the IP address for each of our machines and told us if we were blacklisted anywhere, which is quite handy if you're sending quite a lot of mail, which we were. So, I may have gone up that a bit bullet a gate. So, any questions? Any other discussion points anybody would like to bring up? Is anybody going to go, oh God, what are you doing? <laughs> no? Excellent. Well, that's pretty much me done. So. G tube. G T. Cool. I've not done my research properly on that. Clearly. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. The slides, along with all of the code that I've actually gone through, the configuration for OpenMS, the scripts, everything, are all on that page. So. If you want to dig through them and go, oh my word, this is horrible, there they are. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>